Amen. Hey, y'all do me a favor. Let's give it up for Becker one more time. I don't, I don't know about you guys, but every time I hear Becker sing, I just wish I could sing like that. Uh, but I definitely cannot uh, sing like that. But it's good to be with you men this morning. If you would, grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. We are going to be in Luke 19 verses 11 through 27 uh, this morning. Uh, I've got a confession uh, here at the top. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and willingly admit that I did not stay up for the game last night. And so when I woke up this morning and checked my phone um, and saw the result of last night's uh, hockey game, uh, I told myself, uh, that's on me right? That's on me. I accept some responsibility for what happened last night because I was not a good fan and I did not stay up. But then when I showed up this morning, I was so grateful to be encouraged by my brother in Christ, Ben, over here, because what he proceeded to tell me is he looked around the audience this morning. He said, Tim, I don't think you're alone because I don't think, based on what I'm seeing, many people stayed up to watch the game last night. Now, I don't know what he meant by that, uh, but that's what uh, he said, so um, I'm a little bit more encouraged this morning, but we're going to be in Luke 19, verses 11 through 27, and we're going to be tackling the parable of the ten minas, uh, and that is how it is pronounced. Uh, I did a couple Google searches just to make sure that I was saying that right. It is the parable of the ten minas, minas being a Greek measure of money. And so that's where we're going to be this morning. Now, any time uh, that I teach a parable, I think it's important uh, that we cover just a couple foundational things as it relates to parables anytime we dive into it. Now, I know this goes without saying, uh, but Jesus wasn't just a master teacher or a master storyteller. Jesus was the master teacher. He was the master uh, storyteller. And Jesus often taught in parables. Matter of fact, if you flip through the gospel accounts, right, uh, Jesus uh, teaches uh, over 40 parables. And so if we want to understand uh, Jesus's teaching, I think it's really important that we just pause here at the beginning just to remind ourselves uh, what are parables and why Jesus used them. And essentially, a parable is an everyday story that's designed to teach a profound spiritual lesson. And the word parable actually means to place alongside of. So in other words, why did Jesus use parables? Well, he wanted to take something known and place it beside something not known. He wanted to take something physical and place it beside something spiritual, something familiar alongside something unfamiliar. And he would do this so that he could take a spiritual truth and explain it using everyday objects and relationships as illustrations. So in other words, and I love how one person summed it up, a parable is an earthly example or an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. That is what a parable is, and that's what Jesus used them for. And while there are many details that typically make up these stories or these parables, most parables have one basic central meaning. So in other words, not every detail of the story means something. Generally, the entire parable is taught to bring us to one central meaning. And what we're going to see in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27, is Jesus is going to invent a story here to teach us an important spiritual lesson. And one of the things I want to do before we actually start diving into this uh, is to clear up some possible confusion that could arise as we dive into this, because this parable is like the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Some of y'all are familiar with that parable, but it is not the same as the parable of the talents. Matter of fact, the setting is different. The audience is different. Some of the unique details of the story are different. So while there's similarities between this parable and the parable of the talents, the meaning is different and the spiritual lesson being taught is different. 
And so I want us to make sure as we walk into it, uh, we recognize that and see that. And so what I want to do is I just want to give you a quick summary of the story. Here's the story that Jesus invents. And then we're going to work through this line by line, verses 11 through 27, so that we can understand what Jesus is trying to teach us this morning. And so here's what uh, Jesus is doing. Jesus invents a story about an imaginary nobleman who leaves for a distant country to receive a kingdom. Before leaving, he leaves instructions for his servants to fulfill his business responsibilities in his absence. Some of the nobleman's enemies, however, sent a delegation to the ruler who was to grant the nobleman his kingdom and express their desire that the nobleman not be appointed to rule over them. I mean, that's in essence the story that Jesus invents here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into it And we're going to see what Jesus is trying to teach us this morning. So if you would, let's start in verse 11. And like I said, we're just going to work through this line by line together. Starting in verse 11, it says this. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell them a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So let's pause here because I think it's important that we gain some some context and try to understand the scene a little bit here so we understand why Jesus felt the need to tell those that were with him this parable. And our first clue begins at the beginning of verse 11 because it says, as they heard these things. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm reading my scripture right, I begin to ask myself, well, what things? What things was he talking about? That the disciples, his followers, the people that were with him, they were hearing some things. What are these things? And so verse 11 helps us understand that it's, it's connecting verse 11 to what just happened. What was going on in the passage just before this particular parable. So verse 11 refers us actually back to verse 10. And so what I want us to do real quick this morning, it's only 10 verses, is I want us to be reminded of how chapter 19 begins, because that story, that passage is going to help us understand what was going on in order for Jesus to tell this parable. And this is a story that's familiar with, uh, with many of us in the room, and it's the story of Zacchaeus. And like I said, I thought about an easy way to summarize this was maybe have us break out in a little song that I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with, right? But I'm not going to do that. We're just going to read verses 1 through 10 really quickly. It says this, chapter 19, verse 1, he, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. So we see Zacchaeus here is a picture of someone coming to faith and repentance in Jesus. And look at verse 9. This is key. 9 and 10 are key to help us understand where we're going. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Key verse right here, verse 10. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And here's what you need to understand. Jericho was about a 15 mile journey to Jerusalem. So Jericho to Jerusalem was about 15 miles. So after Jesus saves Zacchaeus, after Zacchaeus comes to faith in Jesus, they leave. And at some point between the trip uh, from Jericho to Jerusalem, Jesus is teaching. Jesus is talking to those who are with him. And he's teaching them 
about what just took place. And the thesis statement for what Jesus was teaching them is verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And so as they walked and as Jesus taught and as they were listening, Jesus was explaining to them his mission. Jesus was explaining to him why he first came. Why did Jesus come? Which we know he's coming again. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But why did Jesus first come? He first came to seek and to save the lost. That was the purpose of his first advent. And so he's teaching those who are walking with him these things. And clearly, there was some misunderstanding among the group. And how do we know that? Well, the rest of verse 11 gives us the clues. It says, he proceeded to tell them a parable. Why? Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. And so Jesus tells them this parable coming off the salvation of Zacchaeus, but also recognizing there is a misunderstanding in terms of why Jesus first came. Many of us in the room this morning know that contrary to what many Jews of the time thought about Messiah, Jesus did not first come to set up a political earthly kingdom. He did not first come to overthrow Rome and to set up an earthly messianic kingdom. That will come when he comes again, but not his first advent. Jesus came to offer salvation to all who would believe. Jesus came to offer salvation to all who would confess their sin and lostness. They would repent and believe in him as Savior and Lord of their life. And Zacchaeus In this immediate context is the example of that, of why Jesus first came, to seek and to save the lost. He did not come in a manner in which the Jews thought he was going to come. And we know that because the word appear here in verse 11, in the original language, it's a nautical term, which means it's a term used for describing something that was on the horizon, So apparently those in the crowd, right, thought that as Jesus is drawing to Jerusalem, which we know this is in the last uh, days of Jesus' earthly life and ministry, right, because what we read right after this is the triumphal entry, which is the beginning of Passion Week, right? So we are are, uh, drawing near to the end of Jesus' life. And so as they're drawing close to Jerusalem, they thought, hey, the earthly messianic kingdom is about to arrive. Jesus is about to overthrow Rome, and he's going to set up shop. But they were wrong. They were misunderstood. Jesus' earthly messianic kingdom would be delayed. He first came to be rejected, killed, resurrected. He would first come to be the sacrifice for salvation. He would then leave, And in one day he would return to establish his earthly kingdom on earth at some point in the future. And so Jesus tells them this parable to correct their understanding. So this parable is a parable about Jesus himself. It's a parable about his delay. The delay of the earthly kingdom. And, big takeaway for us this morning, what his followers are tasked to do until he comes back. And so to address all of that, we now dive in to the parable itself, starting in verse 12. Y'all read with me. He said, being Jesus, he said, therefore a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. So let me help uh, us piece this together. The nobleman is Jesus. So Jesus went into a far country. Now that far country speaks to his ascension. It speaks to his exaltation to the right hand of the Father where Jesus is now. So Jesus begins this parable by saying, a nobleman, Jesus, went into a far country. This is what Jesus was going to do. Future for them, past for us, right? He was going to ascend. He was going to be exalted to the right hand of the Father. And he was going to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. 
That speaks to the delay. We're living in the delay. But yet he would return to rule and to reign and set up his earthly messianic kingdom. So he's trying to help them understand there's going to be a delay. Verse 13, calling 10 of his servants, right? These are the followers of Jesus. These are those who profess him as Savior and Lord and desire to serve them, right? Servant being a trustworthy employee. They're going to be given a responsibility here. Look at verse 13, calling 10 of his servants. He gave them 10 minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. So here is what Jesus is explaining. Before I leave, here is what you are to do. And we see a picture of him calling 10 of his servants, right? Represented again of his followers, those who profess him, those who desire to serve him. And he gave them something. What did he give them? He gave them 10 minas. Now, here is where we can differentiate between the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents, right, it's about talent. It's about gifts. It's about abilities. It's about opportunities. And when you go and read the parable of the talents, you'll realize that different people are given different gifts and different quantities and different amounts and different abilities and are given different opportunities. But what you'll notice about this parable, everybody is given the same thing. So we're not talking about gifts and talents and abilities and opportunities. What are we talking about? Jesus is talking about the same gift that all of us as followers of Jesus were given, and that is the gift of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, I am giving you the gospel, the gospel that saved you, the gospel that you believe in, the gospel that you should cling tightly to. The ten minas represent the deposit of the gospel given to each and every believer. And what does he tell them to do with it? He says, engage in business until I come. What are you to do during the delay? You're to be a faithful steward of the gospel. You're to live it. You're to believe in it. But you're to live it. And you're to multiply this message until I come back. That is what Jesus is saying here. The servants were to engage in business. In the original language, that phrase, engage in business, it means to take diligent action. It means to get busy, is what Jesus is saying. Take diligent action and get busy until I come back. In other words, do something productive and profitable with what you have been given and what you've been entrusted with. Which implies there's a choice to make. Either you are going to obey the master and do what he says to do, or you're not. And what we're going to find out is that choice is revealing in many ways in terms of who you are and what you are about because at the end of the day, a good and faithful employer servant, what are they going to do? They're going to demonstrate their love and respect for their master by being faithful with what they've been entrusted with. And obviously, my hope and my prayer as a pastor is that that is the view of the men in this room this morning. And here's the deal, and we're going to discover this here in a little bit. For those of us that are faithful, For those of us that are good stewards with what God has given us, there is reward for us when Jesus comes back. And we're going to see that here in just a little bit. Y'all, let's look at verse 14. And here's what's key, starting in verse 14. We're going to be introduced to three groups of people as we work through the rest of this parable. Three groups of people, three types of people. And so the question that you can ask yourself this morning is, which one am I? As we work through this, verse 14, it says this, it says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. That's group of people. Number one, citizens that hated him and did not want him to reign or to rule over him. 
Who does this group of people represent? Well, this group of people represents those that rejected Jesus. Those that would hate and reject him. And obviously we know these are the people in the immediate context that would eventually arrest him and kill him. That's a picture of that group of people. And not only is it a picture of that group of people in the immediate context, but it also represents unbelievers today that reject Jesus, who are unwilling to submit to the lordship of Jesus, those who are unwilling to let Jesus rule and reign in their life. That's who this group of people represents. But here's the thing. When it says citizens here, what we need to understand is whether you accept Jesus or not as the Lord of your life, every single person for all of history, everyone, whether they recognize it or not, is under the reign and the sovereign rule of Christ, regardless of they accept it or not. He is Lord whether you recognize it or not. We are all his subjects. And you know what we're going to discover? All will be held accountable to him and their response to him. Everyone is going to be held accountable. And so here's what we know. Some of these citizens may try to prevent him from taking the throne. And you know what? They did. They tried to prevent him by arresting him and killing him. But guess what? They could not stop him. They tried, but they couldn't. They tried to kill him, but Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus is victorious, and he has been crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And you know what? He may be away right now, but he is coming back, and he will establish his earthly rule and kingdom. And when he comes back, he will judge all And you know what? His enemies, these citizens that hate him, you know what? They're going to face judgment and face the penalty of their rejection when he comes back. And you know what it made me think? I choose to bow now. I choose to bow now to Jesus because I know if I bow now, I'm going to live later. But for these that reject him, oh, they're going to bow. They're going to bow later at some point. Every knee shall bow. But you know what? If they bow then, they're going to perish. And they're going to perish eternally. And they're going to be held responsible for what they did with Jesus. I choose now. I choose to let Jesus rule and reign in my heart now. And I know because of that, when he comes back, or when I go see him, whichever comes first, I will reign with him and live. That's the first group of people. Look at verse 15, second group of people. These are going to be the true servants. These are going to be the faithful servants. This is who I want to be. It's who I desire to be. Verse 15, it says, when he returned, this is speaking of the second advent, right? This is future, destroying his enemies, holding his servants accountable, right? When he returned, Having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they gained by doing business. So in other words, Jesus comes back and what is he doing? He's calling them to account for what they did with what he gave them. Now, there's an assumption here. The assumption is that a true and faithful servant would have done something with what they were entrusted with, right? We see this principle all throughout Scripture, right? The tree is known by its fruit. The faith or genuine faith of somebody is demonstrated in the works of their life. There's always a correlation there, right? So the assumption is a true and faithful servant is going to do something with what they were entrusted with. There's going to be evidence of the fact that they were a true and faithful servant. And so Jesus calls them to account and wants to know, what did you do with what you were entrusted? Look at verse 16. The first came before him saying, Lord, your mina has made 10 minas 
more. And look what Jesus says to him. Well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. So this first servant is called to account, and the first servant says, Lord, right? It's a picture of someone with respect and reverence. It's a posture of humility. And here's what he says. He says, Lord, your mina. In other words, what you gave to me has multiplied, right? Your mina has made ten minas more. Faithful servant took what he was entrusted with and faithfully did something with it. And it multiplied. And what is the reward? Well, number one, Jesus praises him. I don't know about you. When I stand before Jesus, this is what I want Jesus to say to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with what you were entrusted with. And so Jesus praises him. Because he was faithful in very little. And what is his reward? Well, because of his faithfulness, look what he receives. He receives a heavenly reward. He gets to rule and reign with Christ in his kingdom forever. Men this morning, if you are faithful, If you are faithful with what Jesus has given you, if you are faithful with the gospel that's been deposited to you, your work is not in vain. Your service is not in vain. Your sacrifice is not in vain. And you know what? You may not feel like it in your life. You may experience suffering and persecution and hardship and all of the things because of your faithfulness. But you know what? There is an eternal reward for your faithfulness to what Jesus has given you. It is worth every sacrifice, every bit of suffering, every bit of hardship in this temporary fleeting life, knowing that if I am faithful, there is a heavenly, eternal reward waiting for you and for me because of our faithfulness. Look at what He says to the second servant, look at verse 18. And the second servant came, a second came saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, and you are to be over five cities. And here's what I want you to see. Both of these servants were held to account. The result was different in the sense of an amount, right? There's not an equivalent result in amount here. But you know what is the same? And this is the key. Equal faithfulness in multiplication. Equal faithfulness in what they were entrusted with. Again, this is not about gifts. This is not about opportunities. This is not about outcomes. What is this about? It's about faithfulness with what you've been given. It's about faithfulness in serving the Lord Jesus. It's about exercising the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to bear fruit for His name and His glory. We all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. We're all going to be given different opportunities. That's all going to be different. And you know what? The outcomes of our life and of our ministry are going to be different. Jesus is concerned with faithfulness. Are you being a faithful steward of what you've been given? And just like the first servant, the second servant, what does he receive? A glorious reward for his faithfulness. Now let's look at verse 20. Here's a third group of people. And I think this is important because this is, not only because it's in Scripture, but this is important because as I look around this room, as I look around the church as I look out at Christendom. This third group of people, this is a dangerous group of people. This group of people, many commentators say, these are the fakes. These are the phonies. These are the hypocrites. These are those Christians by name only who may profess Jesus, but he's not the Lord of their life. He is not ruling and reigning on their heart. And so here is what verse 20 says. Then another came. And now what's interesting is in the original language, that word another, it speaks to of another kind, a different 
kind. Not like the two before. This is a different kind of servant. Then another came saying, Lord, here is your mina, which I kept, laid away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you. Because you are a severe man, you take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. Now, I want to make a couple observations about this first thing. When he is held to account, he immediately begins with excuses. He immediately begins with justifying himself or trying to, attempting to justify himself with Jesus. He did not do what he was supposed to do. In other words, this servant was not faithful. This servant was lazy. He was indifferent. He wasted what had been given to him. He was careless. He was thoughtless. He did not respond to what was graciously given to him. Therefore, he didn't honor his master. He didn't seek to please his master. Matter of fact, he did not truly know his master. Because I don't know about you, but when I was reading that verse, that is not a description of the Jesus I know. He says, you did not take, I'm sorry, you take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. That's not Jesus. He didn't know his master. Even the way that he describes him, there's no love for the master. There's no respect for the master. There's no relationship with the master. Matter of fact, he accuses the master of wrong and being unloving. It's a complete mischaracterization. Look at verse 22. Here's what Jesus says to this servant. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. Here's how we know that this man was not a true servant, because Jesus would never talk to a child of his this way. This clearly was not a true and faithful servant. This is not a child of God. This is a worthless, that word wicked there can actually be translated to as worthless, a worthless servant. And then he asked him a question. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? In other words, Jesus is like, you clearly don't know me. Clearly. Verse 23, why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And so again, this worthless servant represents the people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but are not. And in our modern context, here's what's scary about that. This could be people in the church. This could be people surrounded by the gospel. This could be people sitting in pews and in life groups. This could be people who made a profession of faith at some point in their life, an emotional response, but yet their heart never truly knew Jesus, never truly loved Jesus, right? There was no real, authentic relationship with Jesus. And you know what? When Jesus comes back, or when they stand before him, whichever comes first, it will be revealed where their true heart was. And this person, this servant, it was evident where his heart was because he did nothing with what had been graciously given to him. He did not take advantage of the opportunity. He was thoughtless. He was careless. He was not faithful. He was lazy. He was indifferent. And obviously the warning for us this morning, let's not be that servant. Look at verse 24. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Verse 25, and they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. Jesus says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Verse 27, but as for these enemies of mine, so now he's addressing that first group of people back at the beginning. But as for those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. In other words, judgment has come. 
And so as we start winding this down, let me give a, a quick summary, right? Some, some takeaways. Number one, we will all give an account for what we do with Jesus. Every single one of us. Every single human being in the history of ever will stand before Jesus and give an account for what they did with him. We will all give an account for what we do with what we've been entrusted to us by the master, specifically the deposit of the gospel that has been given to us. Amen this morning for those of us that have been saved, for those of us that have been redeemed, for those of us that call ourselves Christ followers, we have been entrusted with a stewardship. We have been placed on a mission. We have been called to partner with Jesus. And what have we been called to partner with him in doing? Go back to verse 10. To seek and to save the lost. That's the mission of the church. That's the great commission. And so the questions we have to ask ourselves this morning is, how are you stewarding the deposit that's been given to you? Are you being faithful to carry out the master's business? Because we all will be held accountable. Jesus is coming back. You're either going to die and stand before him, or he's coming back. Either way, you will stand before Jesus. And there's going to be three options. Really two. But three groups of people in this particular parable that are illustrative for us. Number one, the faithful will be rewarded. If you're a faithful servant, you will be rewarded. You will get to rule and reign forever with Christ. Winning. Some will be rejected because they're going to show themselves to be a fake and phony follower. This is that group of people that Jesus says, well, Lord, Lord, right? We, we knew you. We did lots of things in your names, but Jesus is going to tell them, away from me, I never knew you because you did not truly love me. You did not truly care about me. Fake and phony. And then that third group of people is the enemies will be judged. And here's the thing. With the fake and the phony and the enemies, the end for them is the same. Judgment. Perishing eternally. Men this morning, I'm just telling you, there are terrible consequences of lostness and rebellion against God. There are terrible consequences. All have sinned against a holy and eternal God. And rebelling against him and rejecting him will end with eternal judgment. And so again, the question we ask ourselves is, which one are you? And men, this morning, my encouragement to us is, let's be those servants that live a life that honors Jesus. He is coming back. We will all be held accountable for our actions. Let's be found faithful in stewarding what God has entrusted to us. Um, here's another way to put it. I'm reading a book right now. It's actually a book I read every year called Don't Waste Your Life. And as we bring this to a close, that's kind of a, that's kind of a thought that I have for us this morning. Christian, don't waste your life. And obviously this is Memorial Day weekend. And uh, we're going to celebrate and, and honor Memorial Day on Monday. And it made me think uh, of this. And in particular, the, the book kind of shares a, a lot of this sentiment. But, you know, wartime, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting time. Because in wartime, even the most hardened of sinners will rise to remarkable levels of sacrifice. And we've seen that throughout our nation's history, throughout world history. But here's the deal. There is no war and there is no cause that can compare to the cause of Christ. No earthly war can ever compare with the cause of Christ. But here's what it made me think about in the, in the book, kind of uses this as, a, as an illustration. And for the veterans in the room or, or for history buffs, and again, this is just a quick aside. Many of y'all don't know this about me, but World War II changed my family. I am an American citizen by and large because of World War II. A lot of people don't know this, but I'm actually a quarter Filipino. 
And my great-grandfather and great-grandmother were born and raised in the Philippines. And it was during World War II that my great-grandfather joined the U.S. Armed Forces to fight the Japanese in the Pacific. And it was through that that he was gained citizenship. And him and my great-grandmother moved to Killeen Fort Hood, where they were stationed after the war. And they became U.S. citizens because he joined the U.S. Armed Forces. And so that's what began my family's transition from the Philippines to now American. And just so you guys know, right, it's fairly obvious, all of the uh, women married white men, and, and so that's why I don't look Filipino anymore, right? But World War II was a significant moment, not only in our world's history, but for me and my family impacted us immediately, because that's how we became Americans. But if you know anything about World War II, February 19th, 1945 is a very important and significant date, because that is when the Battle of Iwo Jima began, and for those of y'all that don't know much about this battle, right, the, the island of Iwo Jima was a barren eight-mile square island about 600 miles south of Tokyo that was guarded by 22,000 Japanese soldiers prepared to fight to the death to guard that island. And, and matter of fact, they did that very thing. Um, 22 crowded transports brought the 5th Division of the American Armed Forces to the island The survivors fit comfortably into eight departing ships. So if you want to see the toll that that took, 22 crowded transports, the survivors could fit in eight as they left the island. Americans killed 21,000 Japanese but suffered over 26,000 casualties of their own. It's the only battle in the Pacific where the invaders suffered higher casualties than the defenders. The Marines who fought in World War II, they fought for 43 months, yet one-third of the total deaths occurred in one month on Iwo Jima and left behind the Pacific's largest cemeteries. But here's something profound. Outside one of those graves, there is a, a poem, and it goes something like this. When you go home, tell them for us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. Here's the point, and this is what the book says. There is a war going on. There's a war going on between Christ and Satan, truth and falsehood, belief and unbelief. There are weapons to be funded and used, not swords, guns, or bombs, but the gospel, prayer, and self-sacrificing love. The stakes of this war are higher than any other conflict in history because they're eternal and infinite, heaven and hell, eternal joy, or eternal torment. Men, Christ came to seek and save the lost and has given us the same mission. The greatest cause anyone can be a part of is partnering with God in rescuing people from hell. No war on earth has ever been fought for a greater cause or a greater king. And here's the question for us and here's how I want to end. Men, are you willing to give your today and your future todays, your every day for someone's tomorrow, and not just for someone's tomorrow here on earth, but someone's countless tomorrows in eternity. That's the question for us this morning. Are you willing to be a faithful steward of what God has entrusted you? And know that if the answer is yes, there is a glorious future eternal reward waiting for you. Count me in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Y'all do me a favor. I'm going to close and pray here in just a minute. I've got a few questions I'm going to throw up on the screen. I'll be honest with you, some of these may may light you up this morning, and that's a good thing. So y'all take some time, maybe give us a a couple minutes. Y'all look through these questions, answer them all, take one, take two. But y'all talk around your table, and uh, y'all talk about these questions, and I'll come up in a couple minutes, and I'll I'll pray us out. Time is y'all's, amen.
All right, man. Sorry to uh, break up the great conversation. Y'all do me a favor. Uh, feel free to drop to your knees if you feel so obliged. Stay where you're at. But we're going we're gonna to pray and we're going to consecrate ourselves to the Lord today because I am, I am believing right here and now that as we have gathered and as we scatter all throughout this city today, that God is going to uh, provide some divine appointments for each and every one of us and an opportunity to steward that which he has given us. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're thankful for this morning. God, thankful for the opportunity to gather as uh, brothers in Christ. And God, I, I don't want to pass up this opportunity. Um, and God, take it for granted that there may be a man in this room who's yet to come to know you in a saving way. And God, through this parable, through this story, uh, Father, you, you've arrested his heart. And he has come to a place in his life where he recognizes his sin and his rejection and his rebellion against you. And Father, by your Holy Spirit, you're drawing him to yourself. Father, you've opened his blind eyes, softened his dead heart. And God, he's repented of his sins. He's confessed you as Lord and Savior of his life. That he believes that you came and lived the perfect life he couldn't live. That you died on a cross, blood shed to forgive him of his sins. And three days later, you rose from the grave, proving to be who you said that you are. And Father, he has turned and trusted in you and in you alone. And God, today, just like Zacchaeus, it's a day of salvation. Father, if there's a man in this room that that is their story today, Father, I pray that before they leave this room that they would come and talk to me, talk to somebody at their table and share that with them. But Father, more than anything, we're mindful of what you said in Luke 9, 23. Jesus, you said that if any man would come after me, that is, would be my disciple. Let him deny himself, no longer about them, but about you. That he would take up his cross daily, fully submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and would faithfully follow you. Father, help us be faithful followers of you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the, the power that you have given us, and the opportunity you've given us to partner with you in advancing your kingdom on earth. And Father, help us to be faithful with what you have entrusted us until you return. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. And it's your name we pray. And every man said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, man.